We're so excited to have our friend R.C. Sproul Jr. on Social Church today to discuss his new book, Growing Up With R.C. R.C. Jr., welcome. Thank you, it's good to be with you. R.C. Jr., before we start, tell the listeners a little bit about yourself. Well, uh, I am uh, living here in Fort Wayne, Indiana in the United States. Uh, Until a few years ago, I was blessed to uh, serve as a professor of apologetics and philosophy and theology at Reformation Bible College. Uh, I was also the pastor of uh, a small church plant there in uh, Florida. Uh, But now God's blessed me with a wonderful wife who uh, brought me here to Indiana and we're raising our children and seeking to grow in grace and wisdom. How did you come to write this book, R.C.? You know, uh, it really... The actual process was incredibly easy. Yeah. Uh, I've written uh, about a dozen books yeah. over the years, and you know, some of them can be really daunting and really scary, and you just feel like you're never going to get through, you're never yeah. going to get done. This thing was a breeze. <laughs> yeah. um, and part of the reason for that is that the chapters are so short. You know, I, I have a, a, a better capacity to write short pieces <laughs> than long pieces. In yeah. fact, uh, I didn't tell this story in the book. I should just say by way of introduction. That, that the book is a, uh, a series of conversations between my father and I that actually happened. But yeah. what didn't make it into the book was the way my father tricked me into writing my first book. <laughs> I was actually uh, still uh, a student in college, an undergrad, and my father uh, called me and, and he knew that I had an interest in uh, what, what the Bible had to say about economic issues yeah. and that I had done a great deal of reading and study on that and and so he, he said to me hey son do you think you could write a, a 15 page paper on unemployment you know what causes unemployment etc I said oh yeah I'm sure I could do that yeah. he said well do you think you could write a 15 page paper on inflation and the money <laughs> supply yeah. and I said yeah I could do that <laughs> do you think you could write a, a 15 page paper on profit yeah. and where profit comes from and what it means. I said, yeah, I could do that. And he said, well, do you think you could do like 10 of these? And I said, I, I suppose if I had enough time, I could do 10 of these. And he said, well, if you did, you'd have a book. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> that summer, that's just what I did. I wrote my first book. Um, but anyway, <laughs> this was just very easy. I, I, I sort of nailed down the, the 25 conversations I wanted to cover. And, and then I just had the great uh, joy of, of writing the story about what happened what led up to it yeah. and it was and very much uh, uh, what's the word um, what therapy for me you know yeah. my father had just passed away and to be able to go and think through those uh, memories was just very healing and and you know I generally would write uh, one of these chapters every day at the end of my day uh, the end of my work day I'd sit down and, and write it and then I'd take it to my uh, beloved wife and I'd read it to her and yeah. and she was very encouraging along the way and enjoyed uh, the stories and so I, I wanted to uh, I, I wanted people to have the opportunity uh, to get to know my father uh, as a as a man and as a father you know I, yeah. I spent so much time happily and comfortably uh, listening to people praise my father for what a great theologian he is, what a great communicator he is. And those are all true and, and, and wonderfully true realities. But people sort of expect my experience to be that experience. And in some ways it has. You know, I, I, I get people saying it this way all the time. Oh, your father uh, has so shaped my thinking and influenced what I, how I understand who God is in the Bible, and my answer is always, me too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <That's> absolutely <laughs> true. Yeah. Um, but I had the blessing of having him as a father, yeah. and and one of the things that I, uh, honestly, uh, how do I put this gently? <laughs> um, I'm, one of my deep concerns for the church today. And particularly the you know that part that that sort of wing of the evangelical church that I'm a part of, mm-hmm. uh, we have this propensity to to look at theology in a profoundly abstract way. Mm-hmm. Uh, we, we sort of uh, I don't know uh, are so 
so careful and so precise, which is a good thing to be careful and precise in our theology, but we, we tend to leave it stuck in our heads where we we calculate the or, or sort of mentally draw out the the golden chain of salvation and we we dot our theological I's and cross our theological T's, but we don't really get moved in our hearts. We don't get changed. We 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 end up succumbing to what Paul warned about when he said knowledge puffs up. You know, obviously Paul's not opposed to knowledge. He wants us to have knowledge, but he is saying this is the danger that comes with knowledge. Mm. You can get puffed up. You can get prideful. You can get uh, to, to the place where this is kind of an intellectual game. Yeah. And I never saw my dad that way. And I, I wanted people to see, here's how I experienced the great theology you heard him talking about. Mm. Here's how I experienced that theology in my life. Yeah. Here's how it impacted how my father related to me as a son. And of course, central to all of that was how my father related to me in terms of God's grace and my own sin and my, my, fa- my earthly father's grace and his forgiveness toward me. And so I, I wanted it to be a celebration to say to the watching world, uh, the man that you thought was brilliant is a man that I think of as a humble broken, dependent on the work of Christ, godly man. I love that story about how he encouraged you to write your first book. In fact, it's actually given me a, a, given me an idea because you very kindly recorded four or five Q&A questions for us so far. If I keep getting you to do that every single uh, week, <laughs> then by Christmas... <laughs> absolutely. Well, you know, honestly, it's interesting you should say that because uh, the first but not the last, the first book yeah. of my father's that I did extensive work on yeah. is a book called Now That's a Good Question. Yeah. Uh, yeah and that yeah. book was built out of the old American radio program that Ligonier used to produce called Ask RC. Ah, uh, brilliant, where yeah. He would gather a group of people in a room and he would have no advance warning and he would get questions and we would record these little five minute answers to him and those went out on the radio and yeah. I put that together into that book. Brilliant. Talk yeah. us a little bit. Talk us through a little bit about how your dad became a Christian and also how he became a pastor. Oh, I'm happy to do that. Uh, I, I, I uh, I'm not sure if I tell this story or how much of it. A little bit I tell. I yeah. think in, in in my book. But um, here's what happened. My father and my mother uh, both grew up in uh, a, a little suburb outside of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, called Pleasant Hills. And, they went to the same schools together and they started going steady in junior high and they also went to the same church together which was a a presbyterian church but while they were there at this presbyterian church all the years that they were there growing up there they never once heard the gospel well in god's providence my father earned a athletic scholarship to a local uh well relatively local a, a, a small christian college uh, about an hour or so away from where he grew up and he went there to, to play football yeah. and uh, got injured before he, even the football season could start and while he was there his freshman year that first semester he happened into the student lounge and there was the captain of the football team at a table talking to a couple of other fellows and he was witnessing to them he was telling them about Jesus and my dad sat down and joined the conversation and heard the gospel for the first time. Wow. And he spent a day or two wrestling over this, not really wondering if this is true or not. I think convicted that it was true, yeah. but realizing that he couldn't make a, a, a you know a cavalier, easy uh, decision, but that if he was going to do this, he would ha- it would have to be everything. Yeah. And uh, so he. he you know, came to saving faith and uh, it radically changed his life. He, he started a project of reading through the Bible in the space of about two weeks. Uh, he used to sit in his classes and uh, read sermons from Billy Graham instead of paying attention, and he did very poorly <laughs> that first semester. Uh, yeah. But the most shocking thing is what happened when he went home one weekend and he went to see his pastor to tell his pastor about his conversion. Yeah. And he, he had an appointment, sat in the pastor's office, 
told him with great excitement and zeal what had happened to him. And his pastor looked at my dad right in the eye and he said, he said, young man, if you believe in the resurrection of Jesus, you're a damned fool. No way. <laughs> way. <laughs> Unbelievable. <laughs> yeah, well, you, you know, probably it's harder or easier for you to believe than many sons in America because you all have, have had to deal with the scourge of theological liberalism yeah. for longer than we have, but, <laughs> but we have had it, yeah. and, and, and it was there in spades, and that was what my dad dealt with. Yeah. Um, you know, he continued to struggle in, in college because he just wasn't interested in what he was studying, but he had, he had to take a class in philosophy. And he was sitting in that class one day, reading his Billy Graham sermon, and the professor started talking about St. Augustine's view on creation. And it just opened up a vision of the glory of God and his greatness and his power and his self-existence and just almost like a second conversion just weeks after the first one. Uh, my, my father just had this awakening and literally uh, when class was over, this particular professor was the only philosophy professor on campus, uh, and my father walked down to the registrar and changed his major to philosophy. And uh, from there, he went on to Pittsburgh Theological Seminary, uh, which was filled with men just like the pastor who didn't believe in the resurrection. Very few of the faculty uh, there would have affirmed the resurrection, but there was one faculty member there, Dr. John Gerstner, uh, who was not only evangelical, but just a brilliant man, a brilliant historian, a brilliant uh, apologist, and uh, uh, zealous for uh, Reformed theology. Yeah. And my father became an a acolyte of uh, John Gerstner. My father's hope was that from there he would uh, get a pastorate and begin to serve the church. But what happened is Dr. Gerstner, his mentor, said, no, you've got to go get your doctorate. And my father didn't want to, but he respected Gerstner. And he said, well, where would I go to find the best professor to study with? You know, because he had that great experience with Dr. Gerstner. And Dr. Gerstner said, well, the, where you got to go is the Free University of Amsterdam to study with G.C. Burkauer. Yeah. And my dad said, I, you know, I'm sorry I wasn't clear. Obviously, I meant an English-speaking uh, <laughs> professor, who was the best English-speaking professor, and Dr. Gerson just wouldn't hear of it, and off my mom and my dad and my sister went to Amsterdam. Uh, I was there as well, but I didn't get much of a view of it because I was in my mother's womb. So that's where he went. He got his PhD. He went from there to uh, uh, several different teaching opportunities at colleges and universities. But what was interesting is he, he found he really, really enjoyed teaching lay people. And in his local church where he attended, uh, well, so he's teaching at the seminary, but he's enjoying the Sunday school classes with lay people. And out of that uh, grew his interest in Ligonier Ministries. And that started uh, 1971 in Western Pennsylvania. Uh, my father didn't actually serve as a pastor until the late 90s. Mm. Uh, and, and that was almost by accident. I mean, he... he had some friends who were wanting to start a church and they said hey would you come preach for us when you're in town and he said sure i'll be happy to do that and out of that he discovered he really loves being a pastor and, and, and in the last uh, 20 years of his life uh, that really was his passion i've heard other pastors kids say how hard it is growing up with that pressure few of them had the spotlight that you did did you feel that growing up you know, I really didn't much feel it growing up as a kid, and there's a, a simple enough reason for it. One, my father really wasn't uh, a pastor when I was growing up. Mm. I was more of a theologian's kid than mm. a, a pastor's kid or a preacher's kid. And not only that, but, you know, nobody I knew knew what a theologian was. Mm. I hardly knew what a theologian was. <laughs> And that was partly, you know, probably the most awkward thing is when I was with my old schoolmates and they would talk about what their fathers did. I, I wouldn't know what to say. I, I, you know, well, my dad gives lectures. <laughs> That's what I know. And he writes, writes these books that he's never heard of. So uh, that was a little bit awkward. But it really wasn't until uh, I was probably, 
in seminary that my father's uh, visibility really began to take off. And that did have an impact on me. It was less uh, this sort of uh, living in a fishbowl kind of hardship, uh, more just the fact that uh, the people that I interacted with socially uh, sort of treated me differently because my father was well known. Mm. And there were, there were a number of uh, lots of people who wanted to be close to me, not because they wanted to be a real friend, but because they wanted to sort of collect me, yeah. uh, to, to have me as their, uh, you know, I, I'm friends with this important guy's son. Yeah. Yeah. And that was just, that, that's always been a difficult thing to deal with yeah. since that time. Yeah, of course. Uh, th- there must have been that space as well where you was growing up in the faith in terms of, Obviously, you know, as Christians, there's so much to learn. Did you feel did you feel a pressure in terms of having to almost know everything before, you know, almost trying to find a, a shortcut way of knowing everything before, you, you know, you, a normal Christian? Right. I, I look at my faith walk as an example. I've got that space to be able to learn and. Oh, absolutely, and and but the answer would also still be no. I, I didn't <laughs> have that yeah. particular experience. Um, but again, because of looking at the theology in the abstract, the way that my father trained me, uh, and I don't, I don't know if it's nature or if it's nurture, I don't know if it's genetics, but, but his mind and my mind just operated on the same frequency. Yeah. And so, so when he is pouring information into me, it is just, it, it's like a, a machine that could lay a perfectly straight wall by, while laying brick by brick, yeah. you know, because again, we just match because yeah. of being father and son. And so it, I, I was precocious theologically. Now I, I did struggle with, uh, sort of not wanting to, uh, play that up you know I, I was the kid who was always starting theological arguments no matter where I was <laughs> that's one of the stories of the book yeah. I talk about is how uh, you know whether I was in, in college or whether I was in seminary I was always trying to engage my professors in debate yeah. Yeah. and I would uh, sort of report back to my father and tell him about you know this great battle that I perceived myself to have won uh, with, with my professor, and my father again showed grace and wisdom and just encouraged me to stop. You know, he he, he pushed yeah. against my pride and he said, "Son, you're there as a student. You're not there as the teacher, and yeah. you need to learn how to glean what you can." And and of course, I had. Uh, I, I never really went to uh, a radically unbelieving institution, so I I was arguing with my friends yeah. uh, theologically, yeah. and um, even say you know just sit back and, and learn, yeah. and that was uh, helpful to me. And again, showed me and taught me and, and visualized for me uh, a better understanding about how to deal with disagreements inside the church. Yeah. You know, I, I wanted to go to war. I wanted to defeat my ideological opponents. I wanted to uh, dust the spot on which they stood off. Yeah. Yeah. And my father would just say things as simple as, son, your goal is to win the person, not to win the argument. Yeah. And uh, was very patient with me as I tried to learn that. Yeah, brilliant. RC Junior, I know as a family here over in the UK that whenever it's a Sunday morning comes or we're about to a Bible study, we have a you know, we have a massive battle. The kids will start wrestling, the dog will start barking, we'll lose our car keys. Did you get a sense of that spiritual battle growing up yourself? No, I I didn't. I might maybe should have, but I. That wasn't something I was acutely aware of. I, I do remember this yeah. on more than one occasion. Uh, I don't know if you have this in the UK, but uh, you know, twice a year here in the United States, we change our clocks. Yes, yeah, yes, yeah, yeah, we, uh, we go, you know, back in the fall, forward in the yeah, spring. Yeah. And after uh, one year, when I was a kid experiencing this, uh, I thought, "Well, this is terrific. I can, I can uh, harness this." And I remember going around the house and setting all the clocks an hour behind uh, after my parents were in bed so that 
when we got up and went to church the next morning, the church was over, you know. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, I guess I had some uh, PK, too. Did, <laughs> yeah. Did everyone, did 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 like everyone else enjoy that, uh, <laughs> that joke? <laughs> but I don't remember. Yeah, yeah. So it wasn't the devil that was trying to get in the way. It was me. Um, <laughs> That's brilliant. Being Christian means that we have to face up to the fact that we're terrible sinners and we desperately need a saviour. Not many of us have had to do that in such a public way. Tell us about that, RC Junior. Well, uh, you know, I, this particular book that uh, begins with the story just puts you right in the spot where I am when I am facing my arraignment for driving under the influence of alcohol, which happened two and a half years ago. And I tried to you know, capture uh, the horror and the angst of that particular event in my life. I didn't want to sugarcoat it. I didn't want to cover it up. I wanted it to be out there. But the reason I wanted it to be out there was to communicate just what you just said. I, I, I wanted the book to begin with a a a celebration of the grace of God and I wanted it to end with a celebration of the grace of God and I wanted everything in between to be a celebration of the grace of God. So I wanted to put that out there at the very beginning. I, I knew, of course, this is the first book that I've published uh, since that event happened. I knew it's going to be the elephant in the room and what's on people's minds and so I thought, well, I, I need to just deal with it. But I also, at that moment, when I, when I was uh, you know, in, in that courtroom, facing that moment, I remember thinking, uh, as I'm contemplating the grace of God, as I'm contemplating uh, the future, I am thinking about what Jesus said to Peter. Before Peter betrays Jesus, when Jesus says, you're going to betray me three times, Peter says, no, it's not going to happen. And Jesus doesn't, of course, listen to Peter and change his mind. <laughs> Jesus says, uh, when you return, strengthen the brethren. Yeah. And I remember thinking, you know, that, that I want God to give me the opportunity to steward this failure of mine, this sin of mine. I want, I want to put it to God's good uses. And that won't happen if I'm trying to make it smaller or if I'm trying to cover it up or if I'm trying to uh, deny that it ever happened. Uh, it's a very, very important part of what this book is about. It's a very, very important part of what I'm all about. It's a very important part of what I want for, for how I hope and pray God will use me in the coming years. Now, a lot of people want me to just go away and disappear and, and be silent, and I understand that. I, I, it, doesn't, it doesn't surprise me. It doesn't shock me. But I want to be able to say, Jesus Christ came for people like me and it's not just I mean, it, the, the, the evangelical church is perfectly willing for to believe that Jesus can save people who did really really terrible things before they were saved but what we miss is Jesus saves people who do terrible things after we're saved yeah. Yeah. And, and I'm one of those people yeah. and my terrible things end up in uh, you know the Christian news in Christianity Today and World Magazine and uh, on countless blogs and you know uh, it's 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 a very painful process for me I, I, I wish everybody thought I was a great guy but at the same time it's also a very freeing thing because I don't have to pretend and I can say with without anybody doubting that I mean it my only hope is Jesus yeah so good you're one of my favorite tweeters um one of the things that makes me so sad often is how you're trolled does this affect you or have you been able to develop a really thick skin with this <laughs> uh, yeah it affects me um it's sort of like dealing with heresy yeah. you know when, when when the heretics out there you get really mad at the heretic and you want to make him stop but what you're really worried about are the people who aren't teaching this stuff, but who are being seduced by it. Mm -hmm. you know, I, I think Paul would be the same. It, pa Paul would not be angry at some Gentile who's thinking, gosh, I don't know if I should get circumcised or not. Maybe I should get circumcised. Mm -hmm. I got these friends saying I should get circumcised. Mm -hmm. 
I don't think Paul's going to be mad at that guy. <laughs> Paul is going to be mad at the guy who's saying, if you don't get circumcised, you're not going to heaven. Yeah. <laughs> that, you know, that, and, 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 you know, when Paul says differently, he's wrong. That guy's going to get in Paul's crosshairs. Well, in the same way, uh, you know, they're going to be trolls. They're going to be haters. Uh, but what concerns me is people who are good, decent, godly men and women who don't really have a sense of how to be discerning about what to listen to, how to be, uh, you know, how to have a biblical uh, standard of what is actual evidence. You know, oftentimes it's the innocent, the innocent who think, well, surely no one would make this up. Uh, that gives the advantage to the people who make stuff up, yeah, yeah. and uh, they mean well, they're, but they're just they're, they're naive. So that, but again, the shorter answer, I guess, is yeah, it is hard. And uh, but just like everything else, just like my own sins, when those hardships come, uh, you know, my job is to preach the gospel to myself. Yeah. My my job is to say, you know, you're. Jesus didn't put you here, RC, and say, make sure everybody thinks well of you. Yeah, I know. I know. I mean, I've gotten to know you quite well over the last couple of months, and I know you're very humble, and you you don't particularly like people making a big fuss about you. But there's an authenticity about you that's so unique, and you know, really should be celebrated. We, you know, I see these comments on Twitter about you often, and you know that we're all sinners right <laughs> we 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 yeah. we all need we all need a savior and yet there's a tone often where it, 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 you know it's almost pharisaical in terms of how people are, are looking at what you've done just because it's known in the public domain the people that are you know right. it's, it's sinners that are writing these tweets <laughs> we're sinners that are reading the tweets right and and there seems yeah. there seems to be a gloss over that fact that you know, it isn't only you that need a savior. It's all of us, right? Well, absolutely. And, and you know, it, it, we need to have this this realism on, on, on both counts. That is, uh, we fall into pride mm -hmm. when we begin to think that I'm a better Christian than that other person yeah. over there. Yeah. You know, we, we fall into, Lord, I thank you that I'm not like yeah. other men. Yeah. But we also, uh, and, and so we're, you know, wise to think, you know, I'm not a better person. Yeah. Than that other person over there, and I tell you, in my in my world, we do that more than anything else. Theologically, mm -hmm. we think that you know, unless you're on in our corner theologically, then you can't really be that great of a Christian. That's mm -hmm. just ridiculous. Mm -hmm. But it also works the other way. When I'm feeling attacked, when I'm feeling uh, discouraged, when I'm feeling uh, the weight of my failures, it helps me to say, you know what? I'm just an ordinary sinner. Yeah. I am not the worst sinner in the world. Yeah. I am just a sinner like everybody else. I'm no better than anybody else, yeah. but I'm probably no worse than anybody else. Yeah. And so the people who are investing all this time and energy trying to uh, paint me as the devil are wasting their time. Yeah. I'm just an ordinary sinner. Yeah, that's good. Not a special one. Yeah. Did you and your dad disagree much on any theological points? No, uh, we really didn't. Um, there were some very very fine points you know down seven levels from what people even talk about normally yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, where, where we might have uh, a disagreement but you know one of the things I told him when that would happen I would remind him I'd say dad I know it can irritate you and annoy you to constantly lose arguments with me no that's not what I said <laughs> uh, <laughs> I know, I know it can irritate and annoy you to have me not agree with you yeah. uh, on this issue or some other issue. But what I want you to know is uh, I don't look at our disagreement as me being uh, smarter and correct and you being less smart and less correct. I do look at it as me actually being more consistent with this doctrine up here seven levels up that you and I agree on. So, it, so in a very real sense, I'm disagreeing with you because I'm trying to be more loyal to your earlier commitment than you are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, uh, it's a little complicated, but I, I, my point is, again, anytime I disagreed with him, it was, to put it oddly, in the service of agreeing with him. Yeah. Your dad always seemed to enjoy a really good relationship with John MacArthur. What can you tell us about that? 
you know, I, I, I know that he enjoyed Dr. MacArthur. I know that he enjoyed uh, uh, James Montgomery Boyce while he was still alive. But so much of that, those relationships were, were born out of sort of uh, foxhole conditions. You know, when you're in the same battles and you're on the same side, yeah. and certainly when you look at John MacArthur, there's a guy uh, with whom my father would have, uh, depending you know on how you want to look at it, some fairly significant theological differences. Uh, they would have a different eschatology. They would have a different view of the church in Israel. They have a different view, obviously, on baptism. Uh, but, you know, again, on the foundational things, on the authority of Scripture, yeah. on the sovereignty of God and salvation, on on the, you know, the sufficiency of Scripture, on those things, they were uh, very close friends. And, you know, their, their un unity uh, actually goes back earlier than many people may know. That is, uh, I first became aware of Dr. MacArthur when I was probably a teenager, and um, my father, I believe, went out to testify in a, uh, a trial or a lawsuit that was filed against Grace Church because uh, their counseling ministry was being sued because someone who had been in counseling had taken their own lives. Mm -hmm. And so Dr. MacArthur was dragged into that as a senior pastor of the church, and, and, and uh, my father had to go and testify. That that was again before uh, a lot of people knew about Dr. MacArthur. Yeah. And but they, you know, they they've been they've been for a long time. They both enjoy golf as well. Um, and there's a there's a uh, how do I put this? Like there sort of was with Dr. Boyce as well. My my father is a very playful guy and yeah. and very uh, uh, unpretentious. And so I would say both Dr. Boyce and Dr. MacArthur were a little more formal than my father. Yeah. And I think that, that he enjoyed that and sort of made, would, would enjoy sort of winking at these guys when <laughs> yeah. they were being a little bit more uptight than he might yeah. be. And there's so many videos on YouTube where they're, they're doing those Q&As after conferences where you, that really comes across. I mean, I really recommend that people dig those out on YouTube and have a look. That playful nature of your dad. Yeah. He's, he's, you know, absolutely. We're, we're absolutely blessed to be able to have those recorded, aren't we? Yes. RC Junior, congratulations on writing this book. It's an absolute must read. So useful for kids of pastors and for people that have struggled with sin, which is absolutely everybody. So everyone should go and get this book. Um, <laughs> <laughs> what's next for you, RC Junior? Well, uh, next for me in terms of writing, I've got a couple of projects that I'm working on. Uh, one of them is... Uh, tentatively titled The Grace of Scandal and the Scandal of Grace. Yeah. And I'm going to, uh, planning to sort of go through and, and relate in both church history and also in the scripture, hey, this, you know, what happened to me isn't, I'm not the only guy this ever happened to. Yeah. This ha and by the way, I shouldn't say happened to. What I did, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm not the only one who, <laughs> yeah. who did this This. Uh, kind of thing and here's how God deals with it and, and to just zero in on that message that uh, our sins don't undo God's grace in our lives even after we've been uh, saved and and then talk about the, the concept of the the grace of scandal is to say the great thing about scandal again is it, it takes away your ability to pretend that you're better than you are yeah, yeah, and how yeah. and what a, what a great blessing that is so that's one project I'm working on another project a series of letters between a, a believer and an unbeliever that's more apologetic uh, I'm, I'm wanting to uh, and working on putting a conference together uh, dealing with uh, this scandal concept i'd really love to <laughs> I, I how do i put this um I, I i don't know i think i've already said it i want to be able to say to christians who are feeling the weight of their sin to remind them of the fullness of god's grace yeah. to remind them of the reality of their heavenly father's love for them yeah to remind them that their standing is absolutely secure in Christ. Mm -hmm. uh, that's that's you know what's on my heart, and 
I, I want opportunities to, to get that message out there. Also, in terms of uh, uh, work, I mean, you know, planning these books and planning conferences, that's no way to make a living. Uh, <laughs> just, or not, not one that you can keep a family together with yeah. anyway. Um, so I'm, I am looking for opportunities to, to teach at the college or university level. I'm looking for opportunities to do writing projects with folks. Um, any of those things uh, are, are, I hope, somewhere in my future. Brilliant. So w- where's the best place for someone to get in touch with you, RC Junior, if anyone's got any ideas about that? Uh, probably through um, Twitter. Uh, my, my Twitter handle is at RC Sproul JR. Yeah. Um, and I and I do even I do check my messages, including the ones from people who aren't you know following me or who I'm not following. So I check them all, yeah. or through LinkedIn as well. Yeah. Uh, I just uh, in sort of uh, uh, increase my description of myself in LinkedIn <laughs> earlier today. Uh, brilliant. Well, what we do, we'll put we'll put links to both your LinkedIn and your Twitter in the description below and on the website as well. Um, RC Junior, as always, we we really appreciate your time. It, it's so good to be able to grab these this time with you and, and, and obviously speak about what's going on with you and about your new book thank you so much well my pleasure thank you and by the way just to add one more thing yeah uh my family and i are not at all averse to the uh prospect of uh finding a calling and a work there in uh the united kingdom because uh, you know you all are english speakers i yeah. can't go to holland like my dad but, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, well god <laughs> willing we do share a different language in common. <laughs> yeah. I can, and I'll, I'll teach you the Cockney accent, RC Junior. No problem at all. There you go. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's brilliant. Thank you so much. Thank you. Appreciate it.